happy Wednesday, wherever you are in the world. Sending a big cheers from me to you. Today I'm going with a little vanilla chai, but if you haven't already, let me know what you're having uh, in your cup and what part of the world that you are joining from. If you don't know, or if you're new around here, this is a weekly series where you and I sit down with all of our friends who happen to be really interesting people, and we learn and collaborate and network every single week on Wednesdays, we grab our coffees. I'm Kim, hence Coffee with Kim. <laughs> and we come here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern to have a lively conversation, usually with guests, sometimes with each other, about all sorts of tips and tricks and hacks and suggestions and all the things when it comes to business and career. So if you were sent a link or you join every week, no matter what, thank you for coming. If you are new here, by all means, we don't bite, we're all friends here. Say hello, let us know who you are, where you're coming from, what you have in your cup. If it's not coffee or caffeine, we won't judge you, depending on what time zone you're in. We might judge you once we learn what time zone you're in, but we try not to. So if you can, join on in. Um, my guest today, I'm pretty excited about him joining us because he has a lot of commas. I feel like that's that's every week. We always have people that are multi-hyphenated or, or multi-commaed in all the things that they're able to do and accomplish. But this guest in particular has a whole lot of commas to his name. His name is Matt Higgins. If you haven't already, please do a little click, click, click. Google stalking about who he is and what his story is because when he comes on, I gotta tell you, we're jumping right to the good stuff. We're not going to uh, wait with a little backstory, we're going straight in. So if you need a backstory, no worries, do some Googling. I'll give you a little sneak peek right now. But Matt is an investor, he's worked in sports, he is a podcast host. He has a lot of different accomplishments and the one that you probably know him best from, he has been a guest shark on Shark Tank for I think it's two seasons now. You kind of never know when he's gonna pop in, but he's, he's one of those regular guest sharks on Shark Tank as well. So he was doing a lot of investing behind the scenes with RSC Ventures and then he decided why not do investing in front of millions and millions of people on primetime television? I don't know about you, but I've also asked myself that question. Like, why am I not doing my day job on primetime television? Seems like a lot of, seems like a question all of us would have, right? <laughs> Be a, a common question for all of us. Maybe not. Gonna drop a link in the chat as always you know that this is a very engaging conversation. It's not just me asking Matt questions, it's you. Uh, you're here, you're joining the table, you, you pulled up with your own caffeine. So I'm gonna need some help from you. If you have questions or things that you've always wondered about or things that you're like, huh, I always wondered how that worked. Chime on in, baby. It's a group, it's a group combo. But I know I'm really excited to dig into all things investing and business, it's gonna be great. But before Matt comes on, I had to share something with you that I've been super, super excited about all week. And it's, if you're here every week, we all share like goals and things that we're working on. If you haven't already, like maybe share something you're working on. Um, by the way, hi to Mitch and Gio Como and Jeff and everybody who's joining, Chris the best, I'm so excited. Um, I had to kind of, make a little accomplishment statement that the amazing, amazing humans that come here every single Wednesday where we all push each other to be better. One of the things that I said several Wednesdays ago was that I was going to launch a newsletter and I have now made it till February. So all of January and now here we are almost all of February where I have launched said newsletter. And I know that seems weird to like celebrate and toot the horn on, but if you know things like New Year's resolutions of I'm gonna go to the gym or I'm gonna lose five pounds, 
you know as much as I do, those things kind of go by the wayside and you kind of forget about them. And you're like, maybe I won't go to the gym or maybe I won't show up for all the things I said I was going to show up for. So when you kind in my mind, when you make it to March, you're like sitting pretty. Like that is an accomplishment that you're like, okay, you know, bottoms up, we did it. We made it to March. So I don't know about you, but I'm sending a big cheers because I feel like Everybody was like, you can do this. And I was like, oh, can I do this? And so setting a big cheer, can I cheers through the screen? I don't know, can I try this? We, yeah, setting a big cheers through the screen uh, because I feel like I'm about to make it to March and I held on to my goal and it's thanks to you. So I just wanna, I don't know if we can air hug, COVID air hug, COVID cheers, whatever it is. Thank you, thank you for helping push me along and push me to be better because I really, really appreciate it. If there's anything that you're working on that I can ever help with, let me know. So taking a big sip here as we wait for Matt because it's a live show and Matt's not here yet. So spoiler alert, we can all shame him um, when he does get here and say, you were tardy. Maybe we, pre maybe we practice like our Shark Tank bite, practice a little Mr. Wonderful impression of you were late. So what's the big excuse? Uh, especially because we're all working from home. So you can't blame it on like the subway in New York City or the late cab, unless it's like I was on my way and the cat ran out or the dog crossed my path. And I guess we could use inanimate objects around the house as like, you know, got in my way and I couldn't quite make it. So when Matt does get here, we will we'll ask for his glorious tale about why he is tardy. So in the meantime, I think we just have have a little chat, just us, as we wait, just like we would in a coffee shop. Again, it's uh, we're trying to recreate the coffee shop as much as possible. So just like in a coffee shop where you wait for the friend and you just talk about, you usually talk to your other friends about the friend who's late. So that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna talk about the late friend uh, before they get here. So we can just do that. Maybe he's closing a deal. Good call, Jeff. I don't know. I heard that Oatly is IPOing. That's exciting. We can ask him if Oatly is one of his investments because if you invested in Oatly, you're pretty excited about the IPO today. I know I am. <gasps> Matt is here. Rest assured. Hi. How are you? I'm just hanging out in Google Hangout with apparently the wrong link. You know, had I had I known you were out here in the ether talking, I would have gotten here faster. You know, it's we're recreating the coffee shop effect where like someone's late to the coffee shop, so you just talk about them before they get there. That's what we're recreating. I'm impressed. I was wondering how you would handle this, you know, snafu, but I'm here. Let me let me get myself positioned. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, I downloaded everybody about all your stats and facts and all the things. And then I told them, why am I regurgitating all the stats and facts? Stalk him yourself. It's, it's what, that's why Google stalking exists. That's right. Well, good to see you. I it's feel like great the last time, to see you. The last time we were in person, I feel like it was in Miami and somewhere sitting outside years and years ago. Is that right? I mean, yeah, that is right. I mean, whether it's Miami or New York, wherever we are, the conversation's always great. Right, exactly, exactly. Are you having a good day? I'm having a fantastic day. Wednesday's my favorite day of the whole week because I get to do this every Wednesday. It's amazing, it's amazing. So what should we talk about? I'm gonna put my phone um, Well, I wrote down like a boatload of questions, which I'm really excited to dive in with you, but but it kind of like leads into where you just were. You seem like the busiest human. Like you have like a lot going on. I, I do. The center doesn't 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 hold. You know. Yeah. Uh, but like, just, there's a lot going on. Like even when I was describing you, I was like, comma, comma, like investor, <laughs> comma. Like right. there's a lot of commas going on. Yeah. And I know when people ask you like, how do you explain what you do? Your sort of short answer is, I build companies or like I incubate from scratch, but that doesn't really cover all of it. No, it doesn't. It's a little incoherent. You know, so for I went through a period where I was insecure about that. And then I thought, 
what do I care? <laughs> you know, like, why do I need to make my life into a tidy little narrative? So it really doesn't, it defies um, perfect description. And we can try here though. Or like, I do all the things. Right, I live in a perpetual growth mindset. That's what right. I like. Right, exactly. Everything. Just throw some like Tony Robbins buzzwords in there and people are like, wow. I know, I know. Like I know. A little bit of Gary V with Tony with a little bit of Jay Shetty, like Jedi mindset. And I, you know, right. Yes, exactly. Just all the gurus. Exactly. So where but I, I feel like at the same time, you know, speaking of the gurus, whether it's Jay Shetty or Gary Vee, like a lot of those people, at least for me and the people that I know, it, it's almost like you can't even put yourself in their shoes because they seem like they're in a very different stratosphere. But what I think is so unique about you is even though you've accomplished so much, I, I, it feels like people can relate to you in a way that maybe they can't to other people. What, like, why is that? Or where do you think that that trait comes from? First of all, I appreciate you saying that. I I, uh, I think part of it is because I hold on to and pull forward my origin story um, because I think that's the most important thing to know about me. I don't want people to relate to me as a, like a finished instrument, like a shark or even teaching at Harvard, everything else I do. I want people to relate to me as somebody who came from dirt, who does those things, because that's probably the most valuable contribution I can make to the universe. So whereas I think a lot of people tend to hide their shame or buried in the backyard of their past. I, I talk all the time about how I dropped out of high school. I grew up in like a roach motel, <laughs> sleeping on a dirty mattress and with a mother who was very sick. And my whole first 26 years were laden with trauma. But I talk about that not to be a victim or a martyr, but so that people can connect like, oh, I too am going through crap. <laughs> you know, I just got divorced or I just had cancer. I have checked those boxes. I'm in poverty, check that box. <laughs> I dropped out of high school. so. I think that's why hopefully people can relate to me because I want them to be able to relate to me. I don't want you to relate to me because I'm on Shark Tank, even though it's pretty cool. And I don't want you to think I'm some rich, you know, random white guy. But I want you to relate to me because I came from dirt and you can go wherever you want in this beautiful world. So hopefully that that, that resonates. Well, and I feel like at least for, from what I see of you from like the social media ecosphere, it always seems that you are also the type who's always striving. Whereas some of the people, once they do accomplish a lot, it's just, I'm not going to name names like Richard Branson, maybe, but like love them. But it, it almost seems like I'm going to put my feet up, write my biography and like bask in the glory of like everything that I've done. Whereas you sort of seem to like, you're always there's always something new. You're always working on something new. Oh, I love that. That's great. First of all, am I still echoey? No, it's fixed. Okay, excellent. A lot of technical problems here today. I'm really sorry. I don't mean to mess up a whole vibe. I feel like a failure. Um, oh, vibe. So. <gasps> um, Heather from your team said headphones. I don't know if that's some sort of secret keyword between you guys. I think that's a lecture. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that's it. No. I mean, nothing on my side that I can figure out. Although I don't hear the echo right now. I think it's gone. Okay, let's talk. All right, so you were asking, I seem to be doing a lot of things and there's always something new. And I think, I know this is a little Tony Robbins, so suspend your judgment, don't judge. Um, that I ask myself the same question every day, every week. Like, what is the highest and best use of my time today? And what could I do now that I couldn't do yesterday? that gets me closer to what, what I want to be doing tomorrow. So it's a little convoluted. It, it, my point is every week I've added something new to the equation, a new accomplishment, and people don't audit what's now possible by virtue of what they've achieved. And so even when I went on Shark Tank, for example, right, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I had the melancholy of like, that was really hard. What could I do now that I've been on Shark Tank that I couldn't have done before? And honestly, I think without the stature of being on the show, probably would have been hard to get the attention of Harvard Business School because they're like, who are you? You're just a random VC. So it got me in the door there and then enabled me to pursue my dream of teaching, but not just teaching anywhere, but teaching at the best place I could possibly teach. And then I spent a year of my life working with them on a new curriculum around direct-to-consumer businesses, which we launched uh, last January, uh, which went great. And now, and now uh, I'm an executive fellow at Harvard Business School. So, But I think it all begins with that question of what could I do Today, I couldn't do yesterday. That brings me closer to where I want to go. And for me, the journey is just in the striving, another cliche, I guess, but it's true. I just enjoy I just enjoy making myself very uncomfortable, coming right to the edge of almost breaking and then doing it again. I, you're a masochist. I love it. Like, why not? 
right? a little bit, a little, or maybe I just have ADD and it's just not fully diagnosed. It's kind of a combination thereof. So <laughs> that's the best. So, yeah. I mean, when you look at like your average day, like today is Wednesday or tomorrow's Thursday, is it like 10% of my time is teaching at Harvard? 40% of my time is looking at deals. Like what is a pie chart of your day when you have so many roles and responsibilities even look like? Yeah, great question. I think uh, that is the biggest challenge of my life is like, constantly scrolling between different activities. It's very hard to be you know, emotionally vested, exhausted here, and then I have to pivot. So it's being very, very intentional with my time. As somebody who's got a ton on the plate, um, I'm actually not incredibly generous with my time because then I wouldn't be able to achieve what I want to achieve. So I'm really intentional. I get up really early. I really don't sleep much. I want to, but I can be up like this morning. I was up before. So I'll get up. Yeah. It's, I, know, I know it's horrifying, but I get so excited to attack the day. I, I like, I'm like, I sometimes I'll get up, not kidding. I'll go to bed at 10 30. And then I'm like, please God, let that light be the sun that I'm seeing coming out of the corner. And then I look and I'm like, no, it's 12 30. Like, I haven't even been asleep. So there's a lot of like sleep issues. I'm not going to lie. I'm trying. Everyone I know, CBD gummies, you'll give me a million recommendations. And then um, it's just trying to scroll from task to task. I'm always falling short somewhere because someone's always being neglect, neglect, neglected or mad. So then I'm putting out fires and kind of going back and forth. And then I think the big picture question that I ask across the entire board, am I effective? Am I largely effective? Am I 80% effective? If I'm 80% effective at everything I'm doing, like that's fine. And then I keep going. When I become to become, when I get to the point where I'm becoming very ineffective, I start receding from whatever that activity is. I also think I'm not afraid to do something, love something, be intensely into something, and then be done with something. People feel like I should stay with it. It's like I graduated, I went to law school and I finished and I got this great law degree. It's right there on the wall. And uh, I was supposed to go to Scadden Arbs. And then I was like, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. And then I gave back the uh, deposit and I never took the bar exam because I, I didn't want to be tempted. So, and I didn't care that I just spent four years going to law school, not, a, not afraid to walk away. That's, a lot of people don't have that because that's like the phrase, um, throwing good money after bad money. Like when you've already invested so much and you're like, like this must work. Yeah. Even though like, you know, if it was a brand new investment, you'd be like, pass. I'm never going to do that. Sure. But when you've already invested so much, I, I joke, it's like waiting for the subway in New York. I've already been waiting for six minutes. I'm not going to go get a cab because it could come any minute. <laughs> I'm just going to keep waiting. Yeah. I am obsessed with the idea of sunk cost fallacy, right? Sunk cost bias that you think whatever came before has something to do with what comes next. I have no problem. I'm pretty good at that of saying, well, whatever, I'll start from really? only because I have faith in the compounding effect of my effort, right? That if I just shift direction that the yield on that effort is going to be much greater than staying the course. And I also don't care what people think about how it all fits for a period of time. I did, you know what I mean? I wanted it all to square. Like, what do you mean you went to law school and you're not a lawyer, but now, now I really, I just don't care. And nobody else cares really. They care for like a half a second and then they don't really care because they're too preoccupied with what they're doing. Right. Well, law school or developing a whole curriculum. And I love this question from Chris about, is the curriculum only at Harvard right now or can can you sneak it other places? So um, great question. One of the things I love about this course, it's so intense and over the top. I would say it's like putting a stadium concert on in like a ballroom, but um, because we have this year I had 23 classes. Uh, last year was 29 speakers, including the Gronkowski brothers who worked out together with us. Like, which is pretty amazing when they were like retired for half half a second. And then uh, we had the chain smokers in. Like, it's just it's just crazy. And my wife, who's a total Jedi and does all the logistics, does it with me and helps make the piece hold together. So the answer is it's only at Harvard Business School. One okay. way to do it is to get into Harvard Business School or uh, or send them a note saying, I was talking to Matt and he was like, maybe you would bring it elsewhere. <laughs> like, I don't have that much power. But at the moment, it's at HBS. It's over five. What I like about it, too, this is the other thing I try to resist is ego. Teaching at HBS is the most incredible experience. And for me, it means a lot on my personal journey. But it would be tantalizing to say, oh, I want to teach full time or have a class all the time. And then I say, like, this achieves the objective of getting a chance to teach, but not uh, overtaking my life. So just keep doing what I'm doing. Like, don't let heady ego uh, take me off my path. Well, and I feel like you sort of glazed over it. But we have to talk about the rock star of this show, which is Sarah, your wife. Yes. Like, no offense. Come 
She's, <laughs> she's amazing. We just kind of glazed over like, she also helped build the course. And like, I mean, she's awesome. And I feel like for someone like you that is doing so much all the time, and how do you make time? I, I got engaged last year. And so I'm asking, that. very, I'm bad, very handsome fellow. You know Thank what he, you. you know what he makes me feel comfortable about? I'm going a little gray and I'm not really sure I want to. And then I see his face on the ground. I'm like, I mean, he, he owns the gray. He looks good. So. <laughs> He's going for it. He's the silver yeah. fox He's going for it. But I feel like I'm asking everybody I know that's successful in business, like, how do you balance it? Like, how do you have this half of you that wants to push, push, push and be the best, be the best, but then also be like, I need to be intentional with my family. And it just feels like it's like the angel and the devil and they like war with each other. Right. Well, hopefully that's a great point. And hopefully they're not at war. They're moving in the same general direction. I always like to say the right partner and my partner definitely is Sarah. Sarah Higgins, for those who don't know, is the greatest for force multiplier that you could possibly have in your life. Like, I, you know how some people will think, I want to thank my spouse. Like, she's the reason I'll have, no, like, the reason. I would not be on Shark Tank without my partner, Sarah, because she unlocks all this potential in me because it's like I'm surrounded with this phalanx of operational, you know, wonder, also the nicest human being, and can literally do anything with her hands. Like, can build a house from scratch. So, but, um, so I, always, I talk a lot about it too, because I think we don't talk about it enough. If you don't know better, you tend to think this is as good as it gets, right? You're like, well, I mean, yeah, they're not that nice and they make me feel like crap. And they're always, you know, I love when people say, oh, my partners are great. Like they always bring me down to earth. I'm like, do you want to be on earth? Like I'm not trying to be on earth. <laughs> I'm trying to go to the moon and land on a planet. Like why? And so there's, I don't know. For me, I'm really passionate about the idea. If you have the right partner, they can unlock anything. And so she's just, she's just a badass Jedi. You know. Well, and it feels like you have a whole family involvement. Like she's the one that helped you got on Shark Tank. And then I heard you was on Bobby Brown's podcast. Talk about how you would watch Shark Tank with your son. And that's sort of what spurred you on the show. And I'm curious because I have a love hate. I was on season five. So I have a love hate with the show because I love it in that. Yes, it's promoting business and investing and it's all good. But I hate it because I'm sure you get it too. People are like, oh, investing, oh, raising money. That's easy. You can raise a quarter million dollars in seven minutes. No problem. And I'm like, right, no, like it's right. more than seven minutes. Right, right, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Why does, tell me more about your love-hate relationship. Like what happened? Well, it's just like, I don't know. It, I, I feel like it gives a, a taste of business, but it doesn't show like it's actually a ton of work. Deals take a ton of time. And I'm curious, like you're in the weeds of deals all day. And I can't even imagine, like you probably look at, I'd love to know the answer to this, like a hundred deals a month and maybe pick like one or like yeah. not even that. I mean, it's an exorbitant amount of work. It is. It is. Yeah. The, well, it's interesting. On the one hand, it's very authentic in that it's people with their own money. They don't know who the people are who are going to walk through the door. That's legit. They actually are legitimately, you know, killing each other and stepping over each other to try to win the deal. And what's fascinating about the dynamic, it's like you're rotating all within that 40 minutes. You're going from assessing whether you're interested in the deal, trying to extract enough information, then deciding to now try to win the deal. So those two, you're like toggling between. And then you're also trying to assess whether or not this person's likely to be successful all in 40 minutes. So those parts are legitimate. But to your point, like deal making, you know, come on, you got to you got to see a ton. And of course, you're only evaluating what's right in front of you. You're not being intentional. The normal investment activity is not to have random people walk into the room. It's to say, I'm going to focus on this sector. Like for me, it would be direct to consumer businesses or consumer product goods, because that's what I know about. And I have a general sense of what it takes for a product to go from e-com to retail, right? Or what it, what it would take for a founder. So that part's a little bit of a distortion, but it's largely authentic. I mean, and I think for people to be successful coming out of the show, I always think scalable and available. Is your product scalable and is it available to the widest number of people who are watching the show right now so that they can go ahead and after you emotionally connect with them, they can buy whatever you're buying. I think for businesses that aren't that, like food, restaurants, or, you know, like it's a little bit less of a perfect fit, but whatever. It's, oh, it's way harder. And I feel like now that you've been working at Harvard and you have people that are coming in to pitch you or whether it's on the show or not, just through RSE, you know, do you look at 
call it, do you look at education? Do you look at college? Do you say like, Ooh, it's, they're an HBS grad, like, Hmm, or. That's a, that's a great question. Je I like Jeffrey. And I, I asked myself honestly, because I don't want to, you know, not allow Matt to walk in the door if Matt walked in the door. Right. I mean, I went to Queens college for seven years at night while I worked two jobs and then I went to Fordham law. Um, that's a, on the other hand, it takes a lot to get the Harvard or Stanford and whatever. And it does say a lot about a person clearly. So to me, that gets my attention, but all it does is get my attention, right? And then it's like, what it is, what is it do I see? And back to your question about experience, I significantly outweigh experience over pedigree, but I put that alongside intellect. One, 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 one piece of evidence of intellect is where you go to school, of course, because you had to get into there and you had to survive. But there are other ways to demonstrate uh, intellect, including talking to you and understanding the quality of your decision making. But I think experience is way more valuable uh, than just education, right? Both of them together are great. But I'm not really sure what I glean from my education that shows up every day. I mean, it's just true. Like, I don't know, barely know algebra, but I'm not using algebra uh, or trigonometry. My son is always like, Dad, I bet you don't even know how to do that math. And I was like, I don't. And I'm still on Shark Tank. You know, how do you like them apples? You know, so it's kind of like, like, right? I mean, just call it what it is. Most of being successful, as you know, Kim, is just about the quality of your decision making, not about, you know, the, the content of your knowledge. Well, and now what I what I've been talking to people a lot about is it used to be call it 10 years ago. It was how do we find the information, you know, find the deals, find, you know, it was very much an information driven world. But now it's almost like information's like a fire hose, like between right. Google and social media and whatever. And now I think it's more about curation. And it, it's it's being able to sort through this like fire hose coming at you and being like, where's the diamond in the rough? Yeah. And being able to do that, I think is, that'll get you farther than anything else. 100%, first of all. And, and you know, I was, I find my wife and I, we're now sending each other the same stories. I don't know if you find this with your friend group and you realize it's all because what Apple curated for you. And it's like, wow, I'm literally living in like an Apple designed universe that's serving up the same content to all my friends. Like how one dimensional I've become. Uh, you know, when member Flipboard or I don't know which other ones are popular now where you kind of curate your own news stream. So completely agree. And then I think in terms of, um, knowledge and 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 content, what you can do with it. I'm obsessed with this idea of like proprietary insights, right? Like you don't need a, a product, you don't need some incredible invention in order to start your own business. You need an insight that you were able to glean either from your experience or where you spend your time, what you read, that is your own or largely your own, since mostly nothing is your, you know your own. That you then make it actionable. I always think of uh, Michelle Cordero Grant, who started Lively. I don't know if you know her, mm, but yeah. she, worked, she worked at Victoria's Secret, right? And so she was there in 2015 and had this proprietary insight of like, oh, we're marketing to women in a way that's very old fashioned and sort of out, outdated. And there's a new, better way to do it. Let me create a community around this simple idea. Well, if there's a community that resonates, let me build a business. She builds a business, sells it for $100 million, you know, four years later. So, I think how you spend your time and where you get your information will determine how successful you are, whether you get that glean of an insight. Another one I'm obsessed with lately is lithium batteries, right? It is 100% clear that the entire world, I know, I know, I randomly need things to distract me. So I read a lot about lithium, but the whole world is going to electric cars by 2035. It's a fact, which means that lithium batteries are everywhere. And so that market is going to grow phenomenally. You can read on the internet right now, the reports say that the CAGR of that sector is going to be anywhere between 13 and 18% for the next decade, right? That that insight is right there on the internet for all the world to see. But if you don't decide to be intentional, hey, let me learn a little bit more about this battery market since everyone's going to drive an electric car. You know what I mean? That's how it kind of all begins. So I think sometimes when you're just starting out, you almost raise the bar to what you think it takes to be really successful and start your business. It's not, the bar is actually lower than you think. It's just an ownable proprietary insight that you can build a business around or build an investment around. And whether it's batteries or something else, I feel like there's been a lot of curiosity or a lot of people wondering about things like whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Robinhood trading, so their own sort of like day investors. You know, I'm curious as someone who's been an investor for years now, do you think those are good things, dangerous things? People are investing money into cryptocurrencies and they don't really know what they're doing or kind of what's your advice to people who are curious about those areas? Well, that's a great question. So whether they're good or bad, they are nostalgic to me and they're reminiscent of a very different time 
it was 1999 and the same things were happening, this sort of euphoria around investing and the IPOs. And I remember, you know, pets.com. I was thinking about pets.com. So in 1998, I was working at a place called cosmo.com, which is like the best company, best job I ever had. We would deliver everything to your door in under an hour, right? This is a pre iPhone, right? And we had 10,000 employees, 10 cities, I think was the number. And on little bicycles, Cosmos would come to your house with your VCR tapes, for all you out there, that was a movie back in the day. Ice cream pints, uh, whatever you wanted, in under an hour and it worked and it was like magic. And so I was there during the dot-com boom and then I remember pets.com IPO'd and then, you know, that like went fantastically well. And within a year, it was like at like 30 cents. So the cycle looks very similar to me about right now. It's too frothy, it's too disconnected from intrinsic value. And, I, and a lot of it I do think is that we're home and like we're bored. You know? So collectibles are going through the roof, baseball cards. Gary Vee's going to kill me when I'm saying this, but like it is what it is. A lot of this is being fueled by allocating our time while we wait for the pandemic to end. And so a few things. Uh, I think that it's very dangerous when when investing starts to mirror gambling, obviously, right? And we're, we're a lot too much of the activity is very in that way. I talked to my own kids. I'm like, oh, it's so great. We're going to set up a TD Ameritrade account. We're going to get you going. Let's pick five stocks that you know about, that you love, that you would be proud to brag about, that you own, children. And and I'm like, let's look at, you know, Disney and, you know, like really great, you know, like long term. And you can Delicious. hold it. Right. You can hold for a long time. And they're like, why, why would I hold? Like, no, I want... You know, I'm looking for the Reddit, like, you know, like, well, that's not really investing. It's going to hurt when you lose it. So whatever, on a positive note, I'm talking to them about investing, I, I guess. On a negative, they don't want to talk to me about investing. They want to talk about, you know, speculation. Bitcoin, I'm a firm believer in Bitcoin. I was in Bitcoin very early. I'm an idiot. I sold a huge uh, amount of it in 2017. But like, can't go up much more than that, you know. But um, what I like about Bitcoin is that fundamentally uh, it can become a replacement for gold it, and they, it makes it a lot harder for governments to manipulate the val a value of currency over time as we get more adoption. Obviously the underlying blockchain is fascinating. What's going on with uh, non-fungible tokens is fascinating. The problem is I don't know how you describe something as a currency if you can't, if you don't know the value of it by the end of the day. If the value of it is so different from the value in the morning, number one, and two, people aren't utilizing it because they'd rather hold it for its potential to appreciate. It's not really currency, it's quasi, it's an asset class. And so sooner or later, I imagine it settles down and then it enables microtransactions, all sorts of wonderful things that Bitcoin can unlock. But for the time being, it's it's a speculative investment, but I'm not down on it, it's just a fact. Do you know anybody mostly who's using Bitcoin transactionally? Like it's so much effort, you have your Coinbase wallet, you convert it. You know, you could do well, it because then it, is it in cold storage? Is it not? I mean, it's, right. it's a whole like, thing. I still can't figure out how to get into my Coinbase account. Like, what? Like, how do I react? You know, I mean, it's still kind of a little bit inaccessible, but but that doesn't mean I'm not long on the idea of digital currency. I think it's tremendously valuable for geopolitical reasons that we don't, really don't talk about and how it enables you to uh, how it enables microtransactions at scale. Ironically, it's getting more traction in other places like Africa and and, and Asia than it is here from a from a utility standpoint. Um, I love this point from Christopher in terms of digital privacy and like the legal implications. Because to, to me, the thing about Bitcoin and, and some of this world, it's still it's exciting because it feels like wild, wild west. But then it's also terrifying because it feels like wild, wild west. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 and if you think about it, it's been around since 09 now. Right. So we're 11 years in or whatever the, the year is. Um, I think it's very, very exciting. The blockchain technology around register, a few things are fascinating about it. One, the ability to irrefutably register ownership of IP that you then can track through through in perpetuity ad infinitum, who owned it, who started it, where to go. So that's interesting. Also enables the owner and creator of IP to set conditions over time so that you can get royalties in perpetuity. So imagine the starving artist, you know, who died poor and like instead, Every time this thing flips, I'm going to put like a like a flip tax that they have a co-op co sometimes. Uh, I'm going to get back 10% of the transaction. Like that is interesting. The ability to create conditions around an asset after, after it leaves your possession. So I am completely bullish and excited about all the ways in which blockchain enables registration of IP, enables you to track ownership of assets, enables you to create conditions. But that's not the stuff we're talking about. We're talking Bitcoins at $50,000 today. You know, like that's less interesting to me. You know, I almost wish like 
can we just stop? Can I just settle down so it can become a currency? So that when I wake up in the morning, it's only move, you know, a fraction of a percent in value, like the dollar or the yen. So somebody out there is like, you don't know what you're talking about, which would be true. I don't know about currency, but I know about I'm not going to use something that's worth a lot more or less at the end of the day for currency. When something strikes you, whether it is a cryptocurrency or, or it's something that you don't know much about, are you the type of person who's like, let me consume everything around this, like a podcast or news articles or whatever? Or are you more of like, I want to learn from actual people? Like, let me get on a phone call with the guy who's or the gal who's doing that thing. That's a great question. I am mostly doing it through the most efficient, fastest way possible. I read studies a lot. I love studies. There's a study for everything. You want to validate shortcomings in your life, you like you can find a study. You want to validate anything you want. So I like studies. I read a lot of science. Um, I'm the person who goes and seeks out so primary source information from first online because it's faster, frankly, than having to do exploratory phone calls. Uh, and you can and do that, it at four in the morning. Right, exactly. And that's what I do a lot. You know, my poor wife has to do it. Like, please put the light down. But um, then I, as I get closer, I will go to the to the source. Like I will do those calls. But one of the exciting parts about now with in the pandemic world is the ability to just, the time to ramp of an idea. It's just shortened. Like, I don't even know what the right metric would be, but it feels like it takes one tenth the amount of time to get traction on things because we don't have to go see each other. So I take advantage of that too. I'll do a Zoom, give me give me 15 minutes, help educate me and whatnot. Um, right. But it's a great question. I'm able to uh, survey a landscape of something pretty quickly, partly because of the whole Shark Tank stuff. And it's just, an, it's a little easier to get people on a call and that and that helps me, you know, get to the information. I love your gestures, by the way. One of the best parts about watching you on on Instagram, I'm not stating that anybody that anything anybody doesn't know, is your gestures. <laughs> like, they just crack me up. Not a lot of feeds make me laugh. Your yours makes me laugh. I'm here to entertain, Matt. <laughs> well, you're I'm here to entertain. It. Right. <laughs> just throw me some digital Bitcoin nickels, right? I would have been, oh, you gotta get some some crypto punks. Do you know I, that? Yes. I think you can make your own crypto now. Right. You can right. So the Kim Crypto is coming. Exactly. You should do 2021. it. 2021. Where are you right now, by the way? What's, uh, are you I'm, in Austin? I'm currently in Florida. Okay. Got it. I How took a little, I took a little detour because Austin is a, is a wee bit of like a mess. I pulled a Ted Cruz and I'm just going to own that. Okay. <laughs> I'm owning it. Ted ran from it. I'm well, going okay. on. You're also not an elected official. You're allowed to flee the, flee the problem. I yeah. flee. You know, I, I there, you, you get some girls. I don't know what Sarah, but like you get some camping girls and some like glamping girls, and I'm more of a glamping girl. Right, right. I say you hi. Know? Look who I brought. Hi. Hi. Hello, the star <laughs> of the show. We were, about you we were oh, celebrating no. you. Oh no! That's <laughs> oh, and by the way, you guys are raising successful humans. That's we don't big. know that yet. We don't know. The jury's out. Don't give us credit for That's that yet. Right. You're going to tempt fate. Like, <laughs> successful dog right here. <laughs> Listen, ch children of all kind, four-legged, two-legged. We're going to Florida, yeah. too, by the way, for, yeah. some, for some work and some, some, some exercise since you can't even walk out of the house up in the Northeast right now because it's very cold. But very we'll cool. be down there. Yes. I love it. I you, is it work, work or play? Right. It's both. I've got a lot of stuff down there anyway, so it's just it's just two days. But I love it. What is your best advice now that we have the whole family in here for like personal family kids? I know a lot of people who are joining us have kids that are always asking questions about like how do I instill these values? You know, I feel like you get a lot of like the fists, like the kids these days, like the millennials. So like, what what are you trying to instill in your son? Oh, that's a great question. I think about that a lot. I, I know first and foremost that he has complete freedom to dictate his life. I know it's corny, but I, I don't think a lot of parents actually do do this. I have no unrealized aspirations that should be fulfilled by my children. Like there's nothing that I didn't do in life that I, you know, really want my kids to do better or worse than I did or something I did. I never got to be a baseball player. I really wish you would. I don't really have those, honestly. And because I grew up under such tortured circumstances where I didn't feel like I had any autonomy till I was 26. I, I feels I feel really strongly about like 
nobody should exercise dominion over the course of these children's lives. I'm here as a source of guidance and help you form your values, but they should sort of come from you. So that's one thing I feel strongly about, and they're all great kids. And then the other is, uh, you of course don't want to be alienated from them. Like imagine your children sitting around, running around like, look at my car, So, which they don't do, fortunately. And I think it's because uh, at least I'm not projecting out, we're not projecting out that we define our success through material possessions. I think it's really important as a as a, as a parent to try to make sure you're not sending little signals that you're determining your self-worth through stuff. But that doesn't mean you need to be denied or not take great vacations. Just don't, don't sort of identify your self-worth. And I think the one value that they see here that is being drilled into them is work, the value of work, like work, you know, you must work. So like our boy works at the ice cream shop, like through the pandemic. You know, and our my stepdaughter works as a nurse in a in a in a hospice through the pandemic. So like everybody works. <laughs> like so maybe that's a value. Maybe maybe I'm being oh I'm so nice and I don't impose my views. Yeah, we make we, work matters. Yeah. Work matters and learning matters. I mean, I yeah. gotta believe there's a lot of learning going on too. There's a lot of learning, except for me. I'm not gonna learn anything that Sarah knows how to do. I actually over index on uh, on being incompetent and inept. Every once in a while she'll discover that I could do something. And I'm like, no, babe, it's a fluke. It's like the awakening. Like I just, I figured it out, but I don't know how to do anything because she's just so uber confident. Why would I, you know, so she tries to teach me how to use the chainsaw. Like, let me just show you, it's not that hard, but no. So there's not that kind of learning, but there's other kind of learning. <laughs> well, about and if, if, you, if you do learn it, just don't show her. It's like, I'm not gonna show people how I can take out the garbage. Why? Then they'll ask me to take out the garbage. I don't want to take out the garbage. Well, she tried to show me how to replace a, um, what was it? What was the disposal? Garbage, garbage, garbage disposal. disposal. And I was like, I'm pretty sure there are people who specialize in yeah. doing this. And just see if she was showing me how to splice the wires. I'm like, why though? It's like, is the world burned down? Why would I need to do that? So it's not that I'm lazy. I just don't think it's a very efficient use of, of me. So I don't try, I try not to learn any of that, but I enjoy tape. I enjoy, I, I, all kidding aside, I think it's so special that you can do all that stuff. It's fun to share it. Like I love making those videos, which are not even me acting, I'm me being completely inept and then trying to be like, how do you do this? For a long time, I thought she was either a narc or like a Russian spy, just like who could possibly have all these skills? She still can't recreate where they come from. She honestly could build a house from scratch, from beginning to end, sheet rocking. I've seen her do the sheet rocking, the electrical, but yet there's a big gap in the resume. So I don't know. Okay. It could be the long game, Matt. It could that's be. That's what long I said. Game. I thought it was like a federal RICO investigation. She's just like going all, you know. <laughs> it's <laughs> like it's like the Americans. She's that's, Carrie Russell. That's She's, when I saw the show. <laughs> right. I feel like I need to defend myself. <laughs> you know, there's that. There's you never that. Know. I want to meet the fiance now. When do I get? When do we get to do this in reverse? When when we can see each other in person, when will that be, Fachi? When will that be? Where did you guys meet? Uh, we met in New York. Mm. We met we met through friends, the the good old fashioned way. Wow, that's defying the odds, right there. Hard to I meet know. People. Those out there who are watching who think like, I really want to go to New York and like Sex in the City and all that. No, <laughs> it's just not how it is. It's really hard to meet people here. When you say, Kim. I, I would, well, and when you do meet people, the first question is, what's your name? And the second question is, what do you do? Right. Like automatically second question. You will never hear another question in New York outside of what is your name and what do you do? Yeah, Period. It's that's, that's a really good Hard question. Stop. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of misalignments. Don't you think there's a lot of misalignments in New York too? Like people want one thing, want another. It's very hard to make all that align, get everybody. I don't know. I'm just just generically saying that for, I think no, it's just I feel like the best, the best advice that I ever got about New York and it has served me so well is that you just, it doesn't matter what people do. It matters about who they are. So I have always thought of myself, like I have an Easter basket, right? And I'm just collecting people. Bop, 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 bop. I don't, I don't know, but you're in my basket and like <laughs> you're here. And so, because you never know, I've worked with people 10 years later, that have nothing that I met them had nothing to do. We weren't even working in the same realm. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, we were. So I just feel like if you're a human collector, it's it'll pan out in some way or form in the long run. I like that. That's a very nice way to how do you keep up with all the people in your basket? Um, probably too much time on Instagram and like not sleeping. So right. same as you. Yeah, that's true. 
That is true. You know. Are you spending more of your time on Instagram or LinkedIn or where's your where's your vision around social? Well, you know what rabbit hole I just went down a few weeks ago. Oh, club clubhouse. I did it for a bit, went in kind of intense, and then it was I had to go to a special, you know, clinic because I was like, this is I mean, I like it. It's gonna be huge. You heard it here, not first. <laughs> it's gonna be big, but uh, you have to be really intentional, and it's addictive too. Um, it's a little unwieldy. I don't know if, and I haven't been on in a couple of weeks though, which I don't know what that says. Have you been on? I I find I find also it's hard to. Um, a lot of people are full of baloney. That's mm. a nice way to put it. Yeah, like someone will be saying something in a too. room. I will, I will touch their face. I will look at their profile and I'll be like, you actually have no qualifications to be like talking about this. Don't you think there's a lot of, how do I put this? There just seems to be so many things devoted, like how to be millionaire, how to be a multimillionaire, how to be a rich, like it's just a lot of that. And I don't, I don't know why I'm like, hmm, can't there be a little more nuanced? But it's all, it's early days. It started shaking out. I just find it, uh, it's, uh, so now I'm trying to be intentional join what I want to join when I want to join at the right time and enjoy it. There is something wonderful about the serendipity of like Elon Musk, maybe one day talking to Vladimir Putin, which he's trying to achieve, right? That's pretty cool. But um, it just, it's unwieldy at the moment. That's no. all I have to say. But Instagram is also a big time suck too, but at least it doesn't feel like it sucks you in as much. You're scrolling mindlessly in bed, you know? But, right, it's it's a little more intentional than Clubhouse to me. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I don't know. Um, okay, I have these like rapid fire questions. Oh, I don't like that. I'm gonna okay. I may pull. Yeah, Sarah. you're gonna rock this. You're okay. you're about to crush these rapid fires. Breathing, take a, breathing. Take a sip. Take from a sip. The diaphragm, from the diaphragm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Here we go. Okay. okay. What have you started using lately that you are obsessed with? Could be an app, or it could be just doing something lately, like meditating or something i don't know but what are what is your newest obsession that you're like this is it okay that's a good one i have been uh i don't have it in right now because i need to get a new one but i invested in a company called levels health uh, first of all i'm constantly grappling battling with my weight and trying to blame god genetics stress <laughs> like sure not that. That I eat, not that i binge that's not it there's something fundamentally broken about me and it traces all the way back to Neander Neanderthal. So my weight is constantly going up and down. So um, I invest in a company called Levels Health that is all premised on the idea that the way to unlock your body and is to wear a continuous glucose monitor that you put into your arm and, it's, and it, you wear it all day long, it connects to your app. And now you're tracking every single bit of your food to see the way in which it spike, spikes your blood sugar level. What's interesting about it is if you keep that number steady and you limit the spikes, you drop weight incredibly fast. And what you find is a lot of what your weight problems are, for somebody like me, is related to your insulin response and your insulin sensitivity, not just if you're a diabetic, I believe if you're just anybody who struggles with weight, and it isn't as simple as just calories in, energy out. That uh, So I'm wearing this little thing in my arm I can demonstrate. Honey, should we demonstrate it for everybody? Yeah. For the people? Yeah, please. All right, cool. We're gonna we're gonna do it here. So that's oh, my man. that's my obsession. Can can mere mortals get one of these, or is we this can. like in beta? Operators are standing by. They have a massive backlog, uh, backlog, I believe. But if you go to Levels Health, you'll okay. see it. It's really, really cool. Continuous glucose monitors have been around for a long time, uh, but now we're just applying it to people like me who need a little help. You know, keeping that weight down. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, you, Jeffrey. Thanks Jeffrey Walsh for just uh, no. putting that out there. Jeff is the best. Okay. okay. <laughs> what is the best gift that you've given yourself or done for yourself in the last year? Oh, what is the best? So many. I have definitely, this has been the season of yes. You know, I tend to find when I face a crisis, I look for the aperture to a better world and I, you know, things go bad. I get, positive and just just do things. So I'd say the best gift is I always wanted to write a book. And early on in the pandemic, I said, this is my one opportunity to organize my life a little bit and be intentional. So I went deep, wrote, wrote a book proposal, conducted an auction from right here. Uh, I don't talk about this a lot yet because I'm it's like I'm I was trying to like make it news, but here I am, I can't help it. Uh, and then I got a deal from HarperCollins. So I'm writing a book 
Yes. I got a book deal. That's a gift to myself, right? A little bit self-indulgent, a bit? Uh, a huge gift to yourself. Yeah. That's amazing. So wait, did you write the book? Like it's done? I am, I am about halfway through it. I got the proposal, ran the process. You know what I love about it? Can I tell you a fun little nostalgic story? So uh, when a positive memory of my childhood, of which there aren't many, right? Being perfectly honest, but one of them was going my mom to these senior citizen homes where she would help clean their homes for you know, $10 an hour or whatever. But I would sit there and I would read Beverly Clearly books. And so I would just remember just reading Beverly Clearly. And then I would go to her to college and sit in the back of the room reading those books. So the imprint that won the auction is uh, Beverly Clearly, Cleary's publisher, uh, going back to 19, William Moreau. I always say it wrong. Um, I know that sounds silly, but I just felt like it was. And then I went into uh, the bookstore and I just sat there on the floor and was just reading the books the day I got the deal. So that's a gift. It's like a full circle moment. Like it it's is. Like one of those I, little... that. I want to be religious. Like I think I'm spiritual. I don't know who to back yet, but like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm sort of open to be lobbied, but, but I am spiritual. And so I believe in those full circle things. Cause like, why not? By the way, we're here with it. Are you going to stick it in? You? Are you going to, she thinks, she thinks this is crazy. I am. I she do think this, this is crazy. Is we're doing it. So, do you want to see it? Want to yeah. do it live? No? Okay. Yeah. So this levels hell. Sorry. You have to do this. So, it comes in this little box. Okay. Okay. Sometimes this hurts, by the way. No, I think it's just me. Okay. Don't tell us that. Oh, we could skip that. We could skip this. You're not going to sterilize? No, we're going we're gonna to drink milk after the expiration date, and we're not going to sterilize. We're going to we go can, for it. We're going for it. Okay, here we, how do we do it on camera? Okay, so never, okay, here we go. Okay. This is the device, <laughs> and this is the applicator. Show them the inside. There's a little. You can't see. There's a pin, a little needle. Okay. Right. Let's do it. Fire away. That was it. I am a cyborg. That's okay. Okay. I'm a cyborg. Yeah. And now it's going to read, it connects with my phone, like uploading. And then it'll tell me that uh, in one hour it'll start reading my glucose level. And then, then you obsess over it, which is pretty and awesome. You obsess over it, like, <laughs> like we do with every app. Well, that was your question you said to me, right? What are you obsessing? So this is the thing. I'm going to go ahead and now connect to it. And then we will, um, okay, apply a new sensor. I don't know if you can see that. It's probably hard to yeah. read. Okay. Yeah. And then next, scan. Okay. You just put it. And then now you wait. The scanner will be ready at 2.54 p.m. Isn't that kind of cool? I, I do believe in the signs. I'm, I think the interface needs to be improved, needs to be a little more useful. They're kind of like, they're skirting around the issue that it's really helpful on weight loss because the science, I guess, is now, I don't know what why, but it doesn't be like, all right, if you want to drop those pounds, keep that number down. You know what I mean? It's a little nebulous, but it does work. I like it. I yeah. love that. Okay. What's the next thing that you're super excited to learn? And maybe that came about in the pandemic. Like I had some friends who were like, I want to learn a new language. Like I'm in a pandemic. Like, is there something that you are really excited to learn next? Yeah, we touched, on it, we touched on it a little bit. Um, I really want to learn everything about uh, non-fungible tokens around uh, blockchain. So I could think about what is frenzy and hype and do I not care about versus what is a sustainable, you know, way to invest in it. Like everybody I know, like Gary V, we had dinner the other night and he was like, you gotta buy these crypto punks. It's like, you'll be cool. Cause you'll have owned one of the 1200, but I'm like, but I don't really know if I like the way it looks like, right. I don't know. like I'm going to spend. But we're, okay. So besides for all of us who can't have dinner with Gary, at, where are you learning about the non fungible tokens? Is our, there's a newsletter you subscribe to. <laughs> Is there a podcast yeah. you're learning about them on? Okay, there's, there's a few platforms that have become the the uh, the marketplaces for uh, NFTs uh, and uh, mostly around art, but other objects. So one's called OpenSea. But if you just Google NFT marketplaces, all of them have primer guides and you sort of just read it. But what's fun about this one, it's like jump ball. You get to use your judgment. Is this sustainable? Does this make sense? Is it just frothy or bubblish or is it, you know, is it really something? So. Gary, to his credit, has been pounding me on it. You got to pay attention. And he generally tends to be pretty good with that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm doing. That's not that exciting, I guess, but that's that's my OCD. But you asked I the right question. Like I go deep and intensely before my attention wanes and I and I absorb as much as I can, then move on. 
and then you're done. Then speaking, done. speaking of Gary, who are, I feel like I always remix the statement, like you're the five people you spend the most time with, because I think that that also stretches into digital because it's not, especially now in the pandemic, it's not necessarily who you are physically spending the time with, but who is taking up your screen and, and who are you consuming all the time? So what are some people or accounts that you follow on any platform that just sort of like light you up? Like you're like, this person is a yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you would be one because you're so positive and happy. Let's just start right there. Anybody out there who's not following you? I'll um, Venmo you. I'll Venmo you the money. I know, I know. It's going to cost you a lot. A little bit of a crypto punk maybe at the, at the end of the day. Um, who else am I following? I always like Jay's stuff. I know Jay Shetty pretty well. Um, and I got to spend a ton of time. I'm, a, I'm an aspirational Buddhist if there was such a thing. I think you just declare yourself and you are, but I always, I'm always falling short. So I'm always trying to adhere to those precepts. My book that I read over and over again is Buddhism, plain and simple. And so spending time with Jay uh, and understanding how he thinks is somebody I spend a ton of time with. Gary, I'm around with Gary V a lot. Like I think the world still, interestingly enough, doesn't really know the depth of Gary's brilliance. Gary's really smart. You know, some people who are haters like, oh, it's, you know, the motivational nonsense. I was like, well, he means it. <laughs> Two, he's really right and early. Forget about the motivational stuff if it's not for you. Listen to what he's trying to tell you all along the way. Early on Pinterest, early on Snapchat, early on LinkedIn, early on, and now early on NFT. So spent a lot of time with him. I feel like I should give you better answers with this. Well, those. and Mitch put, and that's another one of mine, Scott Galloway. Love oh, him. Yeah. Scott Galloway's great. Scott. Honestly, I spend more time though putting out my content and then talking to people one to one and reading the comments. I comment, I respond to a ton of comments because uh, I just think it's interesting to connect on LinkedIn. I find I like LinkedIn because it's just it's it's uniformly positive. But I might, uh, to be honest, I'm probably taking in less other people and taking in the comments more and and going back and forth. So that consumes a lot of time. So if I do that for an hour, I'm, I'm probably not scrolling around uh, Instagram as much. That may, I mean, that makes sense. And it, it's about building community. That's at the end of the day that people forget, but that's what these platforms were made for. Community, yeah. it's about talking with other people. And I think the toughest part about it, I'm sure if anybody's busy, like you are, right? The tough part is you get all this inbound that you can't possibly respond to. So it is a little, uh, it's a little annoying because it is a one-way conversation often. And then you're doing your best you can to respond to comments, but you get thousands of you know inbox and uh, email in your inbox, and it's just impossible. When somebody in my team actually scans things to make sure there isn't somebody who's like really in need of help, and that I would regret. But what are you what are you going to do? That's the part that's really a big dislocation in social. If you have a big following, it's too big that you can't you can't really engage. So I don't have the answer to that. No, I mean that's a hard one, and it's sort of unsolvable. It's unsolvable, other than do the best you can and try, like and be authentic about it. But yeah. And I feel like for someone who has had so many like wins and like a following and all the things that you have been able to accomplish in your life and the goals that you've set, what is something that looks like a win from the outside that maybe wasn't necessarily a win on the inside? Oh, that's a great one. That's like everything so let's just as a confessional now right like complete house of cards you know not a, I, I mean that's i'm the right person to answer that to ask that because i'm so hard on myself because nothing is being expressed exactly as the way i would want it to be so largely everything um because i'm always auditing i would say our soccer business has been really hard it's something that um i love by the way and our ceo is amazing but I, we've been working on it for eight years it's the largest privately held soccer tournament uh, in the world. And we bring all the teams in the world all over the place. And it's just so complicated. But we spent, we invested way more money than we ever planned. And uh, lots of times I didn't have answers for it about what are we going to do with this? There were times when I would like middle of the night trembling like a rabbit, like, oh my God, <laughs> like we are in so deep. So that would be one where people are like, that's amazing. Like you have every, like, I'm like, mm. no, there were times where, now actually, it is a case study of perseverance because we have figured it out. But that would be an example where a lot of, and it would, it would, I talk to my wife about this all the time. People would congratulate me on X, Y, Z. We brought the class to go to the United States. And I was like, yeah, but like, I don't know if I told you the full story. So that's a great question. I have nine more of those. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, you know. It's a house of cards. 
Well, but it's like everybody, right? If you're if you're really truly successful, you're you're gonna find fault and you're gonna audit everything you do. And I actually talk about that a lot on social. Like even the stuff that I put out when I believe, you know, I have the answer or something, or at least purport to have the answer somewhere, I always try to make clear this is an aspirational statement. If you were to audit the extent to which I stick to that, you know, I'm falling short, you know, maybe not half the time, but a significant percentage of the time. So full disclosure, it's most of what I talk about is aspirational, I'm trying to hold myself to that standard, but I often don't. So same with the businesses where it looks fantastic, but it fell short. Well, and I think that that happens more than people think it does. Yeah, and I think it's good to know that because when you're on your way and you're 67% successful, you are way outperforming, right? So it's also good to know that that's all right. And I, I think probably some of the biggest misses I've now had in my career, and as I get older, they're starting to compound, are the times in which I abandoned my insights prematurely because I got impatient. Huge losses related to that, right? Or I was afraid to press the winners because I was insecure because it was early and there wasn't enough of the evidence and like I couldn't convince stakeholders around me. So I wouldn't press the winner. I was thinking too political. Those are starting to accumulate as, as well. So yeah, I think when you pull peel back the curtain on anybody, you start seeing a lot of those things. I mean, um, and now that again, the times in which I didn't press, they like torture me. Like it was in your grasp and you didn't have the courage to sort of just double down on it. I, it's just, it's hard. It's just hard. Yeah, it's all hard. That's what's fun about business. I love when I invest in a business or back somebody and it's like excruciatingly hard, like cringy, like turn away. You then realize like, oh, it's really hard, which means anybody else who tries this is going to have it just as hard, you know? And so what's great about pursuing hard things is, you, you know, you don't have to worry about competition. It's like, you know, go ahead, good luck, you know, go try. You know? And so a lot of what we do, I tend to think is kind of hard. Owning fast casuals at scale is very hard opening up physical brick and mortar locations, putting out the build out, highly dilutive capital. It's not like a rocket ship. Whereas, you know, you could look at a, at a clubhouse can go from a zero to a billion dollar valuation in a year. When you have a fast casual, a lot of what we own uh, in our portfolio is a big fast casual portfolio. They can't suddenly become sweet greens overnight. It took sweet lean, sweet greens 20 years. It took Starbucks 50, 40 years to become Starbucks. So I sort of, I do enjoy the hard businesses because I think it's hard to dislodge you from them. Well, and again, it takes 20 years. You know, there's right. no hack. Everyone wants to talk about hacks, the Tim Ferriss, the Gary Vee hacks. It's like, sometimes there's no hack. It's just hard work. Right, I mean, and it's nice to have some of those because as hard as they are to build, when they're built, you're like, all right, it's gonna take you a bit. <laughs> It'll be hard, like we have Milk Bar, right? I've been backing Milk Bar, Milk Bar and Christina Tosi since 2017. Like, Milk Bar is an amazing, cultural icon at this point. Christina Tosi is incredible. Hard to change that overnight, which I enjoy. And we have a, we have a, we have a bunch of those. It's huge. Okay. If you could give all of us homework, like we're back in school, we're in your Harvard class. You're the professor. We're the students. Like what is our homework for the week? It could be a show to watch, a podcast to listen to. We didn't even really get to plug your podcast which is right. amazing, which we didn't really get to, maybe that's the homework, but like, what no. is, like, what homework would you give us for the week? Um, this is a great question. I, I think, think you should listen to your podcast personally. No, no, well, thank you though, but you could no. manifest your morning time, but because yours is much more regular, so I'm embarrassed by you using the word podcast, I feel like it should be regular appearing at a certain time. I sort of do it when it strikes me. But the manifester mindset, I do LinkedIn lives on, you know, on, uh, with 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 people, and um, I would say that we are still early in e-commerce, believe it or not. And one of the things that I noticed, we just talked about this at HBS, is that last year we did our class. The conventional wisdom was you can only go so far with direct to consumer, and then you're going to run up against the wall, right? Uh, because your customer acquisition costs will eventually get high. You've gone through the low hanging fruit of early adopters and you need to go retail and omni-channel. Fast forward, the universe of people who are willing to transact online has exploded, master of the obvious. But what it did is it gave these direct-to-consumer businesses a lot more room to run and build very big businesses uh, long before you have to go to retail. So why does that matter to anybody at home who's a budding entrepreneur? If you were saying, oh, you know, it's too late to get into the e-com game, or I don't have a really good idea, you can make a lot of money now with an Amazon, a fulfilled by Amazon business or a Shopify store uh, and feed your, your family and make a nice life for yourself 
long before that taps out. And that's because the addressable universe of people willing to transact has grown exponentially. Five years of e-com growth has been concentrated into less than a year. So that's opened up a whole new crop of businesses. So my homework would be um, study Shopify. If you're interested, if you, you're like, I'm very happy with my job, Matt, why are you telling me this is my homework? But if you're interested, study Shopify, play around with it, spend 29 bucks to go ahead and create a store. Study Amazon, what you can do on there. If you are remotely interested in starting a business, there is still so much room to run on uh, on ecom. So much room to run. Oh, Matt, this is such great advice. You, right. you are such a rock star. Where where do you spend the most? If people want to connect with you, like I'm drinking Matt's Kool Aid, I like this. Thank what you. social media are you on the most? Where should they be following you? I spend uh, the vast majority of my time on LinkedIn. I like the fact that um, LinkedIn is a is a, is a is a meritocracy. Largely, you don't need a huge following on LinkedIn for one of your posts to go viral. But what it does, the algorithm demands of you that you interact with other people, number one, that you comment on other people. So what, what's interesting about social, another point before we break up, is that we talk about this at HBS. It's actually one of the most popular sessions we do is about the tactics around how to crush it on Amazon, is that in most of life, strategy is more important than tactics. If your strategy is wrong, it doesn't matter. Tact That's not true with, with social commerce, actually, and social media. Your tactics are everything. You could have the absolute right strategy of being on this platform, but because you didn't know that with an Amazon uh, listing, you need seven photos, not three, not 10, that there's an alchemy to everything. Same is true with LinkedIn, right? On LinkedIn, you wanna post the same time of day every day. I think 10, 10 a.m. is the perfect spot. You wanna make sure that you're commenting on other people's because that's what, tr that's what triggers distribution. Like there's an alchemy out there and second thing, if you spend an hour of your life Googling for it, you will find the answers to the test about how to be stuff. I'm amazed how many people are like, how did you know that? I was like, well, so these two kids in a garage in the late 90s invented Google, and they are basically my Encyclopedia Britannica. And I asked them everything, Whoops. including how do I crush it on LinkedIn? So anybody out there has got a business or a story to tell, first of all, get over the insecurity about telling your story. Nobody cares. Everything's been democratized. You now know everything about me. No shame. And then to begin putting it out, but at the same time, comment on other people. Instagram, to me, doesn't really have that viral network effects component where you can build an audience very fast. I don't know. It's like that day is over. LinkedIn does, and it's going to continue. Now, it's not cool. The, you know, Josh Richards from, uh, from Sway House is not going to think you're cool. But the, the executive at Amazon who runs like marketing or product is going to think you're very cool. I will think you're cool. Kim will I, think you're cool. I will think you're cool, too. Exactly. Yes. So, exactly. I mean, I feel like there's so much room to grow on LinkedIn. There's so, I read a stat the other day that it was like um, only 3% of all users on LinkedIn ever post content. Like the other 97% of people never post anything. And you know what you got to get over? I don't know if this ever happens to you. It's got to happen to you, but I'll just be honest. This happens to me sometimes. Everyone has like their little circle of haters or whatever. Like, what are you on like LinkedIn all the time? You and your Tony Robbins nonsense, whatever. I'm like, why do you care? Like change the channel. Like if you don't like it. So to all those people out there who anybody gets grieved, like what do you want social for? You the Twitter, like all that. The, the future belongs to the content creators. Okay. And either adapt or life will leave you, let you, you know, leave you behind. So don't worry about that. Drown that out. That's amazing. That stat on 3%. Like, so that tells you that there's still a lot of room to build that audience quickly, but you got to commit to posting four or five times a week. And no, don't worry if it's like stupid or people judge you. Who cares? I always say there's a little there's a little X. Go ahead and press it. Just, Me too. just I out. It's fine. And I'm always, I actually, I don't know how you feel from an emotional standpoint when this happens and this does out to me. I actually feel empathetic. I'm like, oh, you care. Yeah. That's so bad. Like you, like I don't care what you're doing. I mean, I'm admiring what you're doing from afar, but I'm certainly not spending any minute judging what you're doing from afar. But you care, which means that you're just like really dissatisfied. So you have to get to that place almost where you're empathetic, like, cause that does suck to care about what somebody else is doing with their life that you disagree with is a total waste of life. And so people who feel that way and judge you, it's, it's, it's sad, but content is hard. When you first start putting out people are like, Oh, but you're a CEO of a company. You're like, why do you need to do that? I'm like, who cares? I'm also a high school dropout. And it is a gift for people if they hear that end of story.
No, so like, everybody's everybody's story has value and every single part of your story, someone else in this universe needs to hear. So like you're doing a disservice by not telling it. Yeah, exactly. And then if you, you know, just quest audit your motives to try to keep yourself at least mostly authentic, it's okay that it resonates when the post does well, because that also is a proxy for connection. If the post does well, you feel good, you know, and, you know, and, and everyone, everyone's, no one's motives are perfectly pure. Everything's, nothing's binary, right? Yes, of course, maybe you want a degree of attention and recognition. That's also okay. We're human, but mostly you're doing it because you want to put a piece of yourself out there. That's, then that's good. Whose question was that? We lost. No, it wasn't a question. It was such a good quote from you. The world belongs to the content creators. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. It does. It's like so many gems. So many gems. Just right. I'm all around that. Right. Thank you so so much. Huh? You're the best. Oh, you're so nice. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you. You are. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you so much. And please thank Sarah. Thank you for teaching us so many good things. Um, and hopefully I will see you sooner rather than later. Yeah, and thanks for all the good stuff you're putting. I really do enjoy it. You cracked me up, actually. That's how I knew about salt and pepper, you know, beautiful fiance. It was like, you make me want to be a better man. <laughs> like, you're so tall, gray hair. You know, maybe it's okay to grow. Go great. Anyway, I, I, I do appreciate you and appreciate your energy, your life force, and, and it's fun to do this. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in person soon. Oh, sounds good, Matt. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Take care.